Welcome to part two of the bureaucracy, the federal bureaucracy. In this part, we're going to take a look at how do we hold the bureaucracy accountable and how does the bureaucracy impact public policy? So we're looking at 2.14 in the course exam description of AP US government and politics, holding the bureaucracy accountable. How do we go about doing that? We're going to take a look. Uh, let's start by looking at the controls uh, that the constitution gives us in terms of the bureaucracy. Uh, Things like members of Congress can't work for the bureaucracy. Um, the, uh, that is important. If you're a member of Congress, you can't work in the bureaucracy too. Uh, the idea here is that the president has control over the government, and that includes the, all of the bureaucracy, which is why that org chart we looked at earlier had all of the bureaucracy funneling up to the executive branch because the government uh, gives the president that power. He is in charge of what appointees do, the policy agenda, carrying out the priorities there. And then uh, the idea here is uh, if you want to get rid of or reorganize an agency, it's Congress that has to do that. Uh, Congress also only appropriates the money and um, and the Senate, uh, when it comes to an appointment in that category uh, for a particular agency, commission, or department, the Senate has the advice and consent power, and the Senate can reject a president's appointment. Now, uh, the president also, as we found in recent years, uh, also has a check on that check, and that is the president can appoint an acting director uh, or an acting secretary uh, that that functions for the current Congress uh, in that particular role, uh, but it is a, a check on the uh, Congress's check, and we've seen uh, the president uh, do quite a, quite a few of those in the last term. So uh, kind of changing uh, the role of constitutional power there uh, in, in terms of that acting role, which really was supposed to be more for an emergency measure, uh, and we've seen that being done um, more so to to uh, to bypass the uh, Senate's advising consent uh, role that they play there. Um, but again, uh, the idea is it's supposed to hold Congress, uh, excuse me, hold the bureaucracy accountable as a result of that. So uh, notice uh, that there are some strings attached to Congress in terms of appointments and uh, and approvals. Now we see that uh, the president, uh, really all of the bureaucracy funnels up to the president, uh, but Congress has the power to approve and fund uh, these particular agencies and departments. Um, and so uh, Congress uh, will approve who's in charge. Again, uh, the president can approve, can appoint someone acting uh, for a short period of time, uh, what, two years. Uh, but the idea is Congress also has the power of the purse, and Congress can approve their budget or not approve their budget. Uh, and that's a significant check on the bureaucracy as well. Now, um, the, the question I always get is, who's included in the federal bureaucracy and, and who are we talking about here? Well, when we traditionally look at the federal bureaucracy, uh, we're thinking of about four and a half million people, okay? Uh, this is the idea that we have 15 departments, you have 50 agencies, you got the Postal Service, you got Armed Services, um, and that's essentially the four and a half million people we're talking about, okay? Uh, there's about uh, 700,000 that work for the Postal Service, uh, a little over 2 million that are actual federal employees, and then you have members of the military, uh, about 1.4 million uh, that work in that aspect. But if you were to include people like uh, those that are contractors uh, that work for companies who work for the government, uh, we all probably know people in that in that capacity. Um, I certainly do. And um, and um, the idea there is you could you could more than double the amount of people in the bureaucracy if you counted them. But they're not really working. Uh, in the bureaucracy, uh, they are working for the bureaucracy uh, outside of it uh, as a, an independent, independent contractor. And then you've got people who work at colleges, universities. Uh, we, I think they mentioned teachers at one point. They're not included here. Um, but you know, you could get up to 15 million. But uh, the the red box really is the the core of the federal bureaucracy, which really is uh, the idea here that you have the, the core uh, agencies, departments, and, uh, and military uh, that work within the U.S. government. That's the federal bureaucracy, about four and a half million people in terms of what we're seeing there. Uh, in, in that role. Now, what role does Congress play in overseeing uh, the um, uh, holding the uh, the bureaucracy accountable? Well, remember, um, they hold hearings and they're going to call people in to testify uh, at these hearings about what they know, what they're doing, what they're not doing. Are they on budget? Are they off budget? Uh, why are they uh, overspending or underspending? Um, and then uh, Congress obviously has the power to approve their budget or to deny their budget or to slash their budget. Um, 
And a lot of times, if Congress is happy with the way things are going, uh, they're going to give them more money and responsibility in order to carry out uh, what the um, the president wants them to do, especially if they're in unified government, right? Um, if they don't like it, uh, chances are they're, they've probably already threatened to cut their budget, uh, as well as their, um, uh, their roles and their responsibilities, and maybe even get rid of the agency entirely. Let's just cut this whole thing. Uh, we heard that for a number of years in different aspects. Um, that is a way to, to basically whip an agency back into shape in terms of uh, don't you forget who, who who funds your your agency it's Congress here um, so Congress definitely uses that quite a bit uh, in political settings uh, in order to get what they want uh, out of those agencies so again this is where uh, if you were listening in the in the in part one we talked a little bit about iron triangles the idea of relationships uh, between members of Congress members of the bureaucracy and members of interest groups um, and that role between members of the bureaucracy and members of of the Congress uh, is really important here because if there's a there's an if there's an ongoing dialogue um, and you're going to have a better relationship with those uh, members of Congress, you're probably going to have a better experience in going through a hearing uh, with those those particular committees um, as a result of that relationship. So relationships definitely help in terms of carrying out uh, your roles and responsibilities and being called before Congress to testify uh, in order to uh, talk about what it is that your your agency is or isn't doing. And that's a really important aspect of oversight. Relationships matter, and they definitely matter up on Capitol Hill. Uh, definitely saw that in my time. Uh, but the um, but the idea of that relationship with the uh, with the bureaucracy and members uh, of the bureaucracy is really helpful in terms of rulemaking, in terms of regulatory writing, of of carrying out the law, and also in terms of. Um, of, of getting a, a better pulse on what Congress is really looking for. What was their intent in, in passing this law to make sure that the rulemaking and the regulation around it uh, really um, emulates the, the type of lawmaking that the, the Congress really intended in the first place. All right, so um, Congress can also step in if they see that, uh, hey, uh, we're not exactly looking at this in terms of uh, uh, of what uh, the rules you passed and that sort of thing. Maybe we were off the mark here. So Congress can pass new legislation uh, that tries to address this, uh, tries to either limit the power of the bureaucracy or clarify the power of the bureaucracy in terms of rulemaking and really kind of guide them more into doing what Congress really wanted them to do in the first place. Uh, so this, this clarification of discretion uh, is really important here in terms of getting uh, the agency or the parts of the bureaucracy to do what Congress wants them to do. That is definitely a check uh, on the bureaucracy's power. In addition to that, uh, we know that the president um, has these agency heads that serve at the president's discretion. The president can fire them at any time. The president can also issue an executive order uh, to basically trump whatever it is that they're doing, uh, can basically supersede whatever it is that uh, that they're they're going through right now. And um, they can all, the president can also reorganize different aspects. Now, you got to be careful here uh, because uh, the president can reorganize in terms of different aspects of moving things around um, within an agency, but can't reorganize an agency themselves. Because remember, that is Congress's job. Congress's job is to, to either authorize, approve, or abolish uh, different agencies and, and programs. So while the president has a little bit of authority there in terms of uh, what he can do within an agency, within the bureaucracy, uh, really Congress's job, I mean, Homeland Security, for example, is a great example of where after 9-11, um, the president, President George W. Bush said, we really need an agency that streamlines all of our homeland security. Um, and, um, and while the president came up with that suggestion, the president has no power there. It is Congress that has to pass that that particular um, that the creation of that agency, which they did, uh, Congress did pass that, and they created the Department of Homeland Security, uh, which a lot of these other uh, agencies funnel into as part of an org chart. Um, but it was designed to streamline intelligence in order to prevent a 9/11 from ever happening again. And um, and it is Congress's job uh, that carries that out. Okay. Uh, the idea here is uh, Congress. Um, can also pass the budget uh, or, or slash the budget uh, in terms of programs they want to see carried out. Um, the president proposes those budgetary measures uh, as well as policies, but again, it's Congress that passes those laws. It's Congress that passes the budget here. Um, Congress also confirms those heads of the different agencies, and again, that's the Senate uh, that has that role. And then the Congress that is writing the laws uh, that is either going to expand uh, the bureaucracy's power or limit the bureaucracy 
king's power. And then the judiciary can step in. They do have some checks on the bureaucracy here as well uh, in terms of uh, whether something is constitutional or not constitutional, unconstitutional, in terms of rules or regulations that the bureaucracy carries out. Uh, but the whole idea here is uh, they're also going to look and say, hey, did a bureaucrat step over the line? Uh, did they go too far in what they did in trying to uh, enforce the law? And, um, and, and courts have stepped in to say, whoa, bureaucrats went too far. That's unconstitutional. Uh, that is a check on the bureaucracy as well. And does uh, get the bureaucracy to pay attention to, uh, hey, are we going beyond where we should be here in terms of what we should be carrying out? Uh, those are really important aspects uh, of checks on the bureaucracy. Now, uh, notice that uh, the presidential checks uh, are really important because this ties back to the president's agenda. What is the president's policy agenda? What are the priorities the president has here? And the president is going to want the bureaucracy to mirror or mimic uh, what the president's agenda is. Uh, the president doesn't want you to focus on things that don't matter to the president's agenda. So uh, President Obama's agenda, very different from President Trump's agenda, and President-elect Biden's agenda is probably going to be very different from President Trump's agenda in terms of how the bureaucracy should carry this out. Out. That can be a major, uh, uh, major obstacle uh, for trying to get uh, the bureaucracy um, up and running and, and passing laws and rules and regulations. Because so many times uh, they, uh, again, they have policies and procedures around this. They have comment periods. Uh, they put this out for public comment, and then they have to put this out for final rule on public public comment, and they have to get the public's input, and then they issue the, the rule uh, as a result of that. And then they have a waiting period before they actually put the rule into effect and start enforcing that rule. All of those things take time, and that time is critical if you're switching administrations, and all of a sudden you're, you're trying to change the rules of the game. Uh, you can see here that uh, even some agencies... Um, uh, now are just implementing a lot of the uh, the rulemaking, the f the final rules that have gone to public comment, and are now just being implemented uh, into Trump the Trump administration's policy agenda. And it's the end of the fourth year in which uh, they have been in office. So you can see how long some of the rules and regulations are, uh, how long it takes uh, to really dial those back in terms of trying and addressing those. So that's pretty incredible in that um, it really does take time. Uh, time is, is not on your side if you've only got four years uh, in terms of trying to carry that out. Uh, and that really poses a significant challenge for the bureaucracy uh, because again, the pendulum is probably gonna swing in the other direction. And again, the process starts all over. Uh, in terms of uh, trying to address that. Now notice um, the total number of federal employees is much greater for contractors. We've continued to see this rise um, uh, than it is for civil servants, those in the civil service program or postal workers, that kind of thing. Um, uh, but this is a really great graph in that it addresses this idea of um, we have a lot more people outside of government working for government than inside of government working for government. And by the way, state and local governments have a significant number of employees. Uh, you think the, the federal bureaucracy is large. Uh, you should look at state and local governments and how many people uh, they have on the ground there. Because again, federalism, they're doing the work of, of national, state, and local governments in terms of trying to carry out or implement the law, uh, which is, uh, which is again, uh, drain the swamp. Is the era of big government really over? Well, maybe not so much. Um, uh, contracting out is a, an important aspect, and NASA is a really good example of this. Uh, we saw that um, Elon Musk and uh, uh, really uh, uh, sending the uh, the shuttle up to the space station and trying to find ways uh, to get a, uh, a a device to go to the uh, space station. Uh, we use private contractors now to do that. NASA used to do that themselves. Uh, prisons, uh, many of them are, are commercial prisons uh, that are contracted out to private sector companies uh, that are carrying this out. If you've ever seen Orange is the New Black on Netflix, a good example of um, uh, again, fictional, uh, but the idea is, um, you know, maybe sometimes truth is stranger than fiction, uh, that there are some aspects to that uh, in which uh, they're trying to cut costs and trying to address those uh, issues of trying to make money off of uh, running a, a, a federal prison. And um, and so we see some contracting out there too. Um, but uh, we do have a lot more contractors than we do civil service employees. And uh, and this is one aspect to think about. Uh, technology is probably a space in which we see um, a lot of contractors um, that are working in the technical space, in the technology space, uh, that are working for the government, but not necessarily, not necessarily as a civil service employees within the government. And that uh, is an important aspect because, again, you want the technological expertise of individuals 
uh, carrying out um, the best technologies, the newest technologies, the best security and, and the newest uh, safeguards that are in place to protect uh, government documents and, and government information uh, from getting into the wrong hands. And so you definitely want to have you know, the best of the best on that, those jobs in order to carry those things out. So contractors in many cases are, um, are a lot of those people. And uh, we, have, uh, we have a lot of specialized experts and, and, um, and you know, amazing uh, technological geniuses in their field that are working within the civil service, uh, but they uh, many times are working to manage those projects with outside contractors in terms of carrying that out and kind of the, the, what they call the best of breed approaches uh, in terms of helping uh, government to uh, uh, to have better systems in place uh, to help protect those uh, government that government information, uh, but they're relying on outside contractors to do it. Uh, and that really is an important aspect. So uh, who are these bureaucrats? Uh, well, they're not elected officials. Uh, they are presidential appointees at the top. Uh, and then they are the SES. I mentioned about 7,000 people that work for the SES, this senior executive service. These are the top uh, individuals in the uh, civil service. They're the creme de la creme of the civil service. Uh, they're the uh, longest serving members. Uh, they're the best paid. Uh, they're the most experienced. And... Um, and they are chosen based on merit. Uh, they are chosen based on uh, their expertise in the field and their their um, uh, their know-how and ability to work with problems and get things done. And that really is critical uh, for the um, uh, for the agency and the departments there, uh, but also really critical in terms of carrying out the law. And then we have the civil servants, those that work uh, in merit-based jobs uh, that are, are part of the civil service. They take an exam, uh, you pass it, you get placed on the hierarchy in terms of where you are on the GS levels, and then uh, you're placed into those jobs. Many of them are very focused on particular indus in, uh, industry aspects. So if it is um, the Internal Revenue Service, chances are you're probably uh, a tax accountant or somebody working in, in financial uh, aspects or, or something along those lines or an interest in those areas, uh, and they can train you. Um, along those aspects. Uh, but, but they are people who work within these, uh, these departments and agencies. Again, they cannot be elected officials. Uh, they cannot be members of Congress uh, that are working here. And if you are a political appointee, uh, you can be fired by the president at any time. Uh, you are at the top of those agencies, at the top of the, uh, uh, of, of the food chain in that particular department. Um, but beneath them then is the SES and then the civil service. Uh, and those cannot be fired by the president. The SES and the civil service, uh, they are, because they are civil service, they cannot be fired by the president. Um, and if anything, it's actually hard uh, to uh, to fire them. And the reason is because uh, they're hired based on merit. They're hired uh, based on on what they know and how they do their job and how professional they are and what uh, professional um, certifications they may have. Uh, the Pendleton Civil Service Act in 1883 basically ended the spoil system that we saw under uh, presidents like Andrew Jackson. They basically came in and brought in all their cronies with them and said, hey, uh, we'll give everybody a job, right? Um, and they didn't have expertise in areas. They didn't know what they were doing. And you want to talk about waste, fraud, and abuse and corruption. Um, you have people in agencies that don't know what they're doing, don't know how to carry out their job, and they're basically running the running the department. Um, and um, and there's no one there to help them in the SES. Uh, so as a result, uh, Congress passed the Pendleton Civil Service Act, which basically established this system of civil service. You take an exam, you go into the hierarchy of the civil service, um, you, you get a GS rating, and you move throughout that process based on merit, based on your success in government and what you have done. And again, um, if you do well and uh, throughout the year, you do a good job, you don't screw up, you move up to the next rung on the ladder, you get you get a pay raise and that sort of thing. So, um, and, and you move up on that hierarchy, that ladder-based structure. Again, a definite theory of influence in terms of um, the hierarchical structure of bureauc bureaucracy there. So uh, the bureaucratic form of, of, um, of the theory of influence. Uh, and you need it. When you have four and a half million people that are working within the government, you need to have some level of structure. You need to have some level uh, of order. And this hierarchy really uh, provides that. And it's the Pendleton Act uh, that really made this happen. Okay. Um, now notice that cabinet departments uh, really make up the biggest part of the bureaucracy. 70% of employees coming from those cabinet level positions, uh, which is why they are the president's cabinet, why they are, why they are appointed by the president 
president to, to lead those departments, secretaries of whatever, and uh, why they need to be confirmed by the Senate, um, because it's significant in terms of the number of people uh, that work within those uh, those agencies. Uh, you think of an agency like uh, the Health and Human Services, or you think of uh, Department of Defense. Um, these are really large um uh, departments uh, that make up the bureaucracy and many people working within that hierarchical structure uh, that we see there. Now, uh, the Pendleton Act, I mean, think of it like this. Um, how did how does this differentiate the people that we see? Well, uh, a secretary is a patronage job, okay? It's not a merit-based job. Now, the um, uh, again, the secretary uh, is patronage and the subsecretary also patronage appointed by the president essentially is what patronage is. Um, you're giving to the winner go the spoils, uh, to the winner goes the patronage. The idea here is Secretary of State Mike Pompeo uh, is is appointed by President Trump to be the Secretary of State. Um, there are other people under him who also work at the State Department uh, that were also appointed to those positions uh, by the president, and uh, they work at the um, uh, at the will of the president. But there are more than seventy five thousand people that work in the State Department, not just uh, not just down at Foggy Bottom, uh, but in the State Department or in, in different embassies and consulates around the world and in different uh, cities uh, in, in, in across the country that work for the State Department. Um, but they are civil service, okay? So the, the, uh, the, the 75,000 are civil service employees. Only a few hundred at the very top are uh, patronage jobs, are appointed by the president. Uh, and uh, the idea there is, so you have a very small group of, of leaders. Uh, they are in leadership positions uh, of the agency in terms of carrying out the president's policy agenda and priorities. Um, but they are not um, they are uh, they are not the entire agency. They're not taking over uh, the entire department. Uh, they are using the resources and staff that they have there in order to carry out their agenda. Um, but uh, there is a much bigger force that is at work doing a lot of the minutia uh, that we don't even think about uh, in in a political sense. Uh, things like making sure that uh, people are at that are at an embassy uh, have resources, have access to things like toilet paper and uh, and laundering and and uh, safety and security and um, and they're in in safe settings. Uh, those types of things uh, the 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 Secretary of State isn't thinking about. Uh, that's not the policy uh, of the administration. Uh, it's the bureaucrats within the State Department that are handling those types of things, so that they go off without a hitch uh, in most cases. Now the Hatch Act. Uh, let's let's talk about the Hatch Act for a second, because we've been talking about the Pendleton Act. The Hatch Act. Uh, basically came in 1939 uh, because there were a lot of people that were working in the bureaucracy and um, the concern was uh, that they were very active in partisan politics, uh, that they were really taking a much bigger role in uh, in helping people get elected and um, and they weren't really um, uh, seeing the, the, the fine line between working for the bureaucracy and uh, carrying on partisan functions uh, in terms of how that, that carries out. Um, so uh, the Hatch Act basically said uh, you can vote uh, as a government bureaucrat, but you can't take an active role in partisan politics. Now, we have seen a lot of that interpretation really dialed back in terms of what you can do. Um, there are people that work for the government that do participate in partisan politics. Many of them do it behind the scenes. Many of them uh, are working on campaigns or working within uh, their party, um, but they're not necessarily uh, being the face of their party. They're not running for specific um, positions within uh, their parties or that kind of thing. And um, they can hold those positions um, and uh, and they can help in terms of raising money or campaigning or passing out literature and whatnot. Um, so that has uh, that ha that is different in terms of uh, how that's been kind of dialed back a bit or relaxed is probably a better word. Um, but uh, they they cannot run for office. Uh, so if they are a civ member of the civil service uh, and they decide they're going to run for office, they have to give up their job. So uh, in order to do that, they would have to uh, step down. Uh, or take a leave of absence in order to do that. Um, so that is one aspect of the Hatch Act that, that does still apply. Um, now, it, it's common sense to know that uh, they can't do any of these functions from an official capacity 
in their federal office. Um, they can't use the copy machine or use their phones or that kind of thing, any um, uh, resources. And I think that's probably, probably pretty common knowledge. And during coronavirus, they're not in their office anyway, so they're at home using probably their cell phone or something uh, anyway. So that uh, wouldn't really matter. But the idea there is it did restrict uh, what people could do that worked for the civil service in terms of how they could um, how they could participate in political activities, and it did limit to some extent uh, what they could and could not do. Now, true or false, the head of agencies can easily fire the bureaucrats in their agency. Uh, that is a big fact false, uh, and the reason is because it's the president that could fire the head of that agency, uh, not um, the head of that agency. Uh, and, and by the way, that's only political appointees. Bureaucrats can't be fired. Uh, the idea is because if they're a part of the civil service, it is a very long process, takes a long time, and in many cases, um, it's nearly impossible in terms of the in terms of of just the minutia of paperwork and uh, processes that have to be followed in order to fire that person. Uh, and many uh, supervisors uh, will change and move and move positions and jobs along the way uh, that they're not even there long enough in order to carry that out. Uh, so that is one aspect uh, that really lends itself uh, to part of the bureaucracy in which people hide, especially people that are bad at their jobs, hide because they know, hey, what are you going to do, fire me? Um, and that really is the aspect they take. Now, luckily, those people aren't ones uh, that, that continue to, um, um, you know, those aren't, those, those are a very small minority of civil service members uh, that are carrying that, that are, that are participating like that. Um, this isn't uh, perpetual in terms of most people uh, that are doing, are working very hard at their jobs and, and very successful in what they do. Uh, but there are aspects of the bureaucracy in which there are people like that that do hide in those agencies because they're like, what are you going to do, fire me? Um, and, uh, and, and some have been fired uh, along the way, but it is very hard uh, to carry that out. It's very hard to do that. Um, so, uh, what have we seen over the years? Remember, I mentioned this earlier, the idea that civil uh, service employees uh, at the federal level, it's, it's been pretty steady. Uh, it's actually in state and local government we've seen an explosion through the years. Um, and, uh, and it's because uh, who's carrying out the law? Well, the national government uh, is using federalism. The national government is relying on state and local government uh, to be the boots on the ground in order to help us carry out or enforce the law. So whether it comes to administrative discretion uh, with putting cops on streets or uh, uh, distributing funds to public school systems or distrib distributing funds to local and state highways, uh, it's the state and local government that is really tasked with carrying that out. And so that's why we've seen uh, a lot of the growth uh, isn't in the federal government themselves, but in the state and local government in terms of where this happens. And that is a significant trend uh, that really gets brushed under the rug. We don't talk a lot about that, but it really is the state and local government that we've seen an explosion of growth. Uh, so when we talk about the, the era of big government is over, it is alive and well, people. It is alive and well. Uh, and we see there that it's not in the uh, the federal uh, that we've seen that, that growth. It's really in the state and local governments uh, that that takes place. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details in terms of, because uh, we've talked about a lot of this already uh, in, the, uh, in the previous... Um, segment on this overview video. But you can notice here in, in terms of the aspect of, of rulemaking and implementation of the, the bill that becomes a law, uh, Congress steps in and uh, passes the law. The president signs it, gives it to the agency. The agency then uh, puts it out for uh, 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 looking at the aspects of the, the bill and, and what the, the intent of Congress was, and then um, puts it out for public comment uh, to start to draft rules and regulations around it. Um, they, they put it out there for public comment. Uh, they hold a hearing in which people can uh, submit in writing their comments as well as uh, and or show up uh, to comment on these proposed rules. And, um, and then they'll start to circulate drafts. Uh, so they'll uh, circulate a draft, send it out, and again ask for comments. Uh, as a result of that, they'll incorporate comments, hold another hearing, uh, and usually issue some type of a final rule. That final rule then will again allow for a comment period. And you can see if you have 30 or 60 days for comment periods in between each of these rule drafting, you can see how it could take easily a year uh, in order to, to carry out uh, a particular uh, law in terms of implementing it just because of all the comment periods you have in place. Uh, but the idea is a final rule uh, issues a comment period. You have, you know, 30, 60, 90 days, whatever it is. 
and then uh, you issue the final rule. And then you usually have some type of a, uh, a grace period in which uh, we're not going to implement it just yet, but we're publishing uh, what the, uh, the rules will be. In 90 days, uh, we will set forth uh, what these rules are, and then we will carry them out that way. And that um, is essentially, uh, and then they'll be talking with members of Congress, probably called in for hearings about it uh, before members of Congress, all in an effort to try and get it right. And sometimes they get it right, and sometimes they don't get it right. But the idea is um, this is how that process of implementation of the law actually takes place. And then this leads to enforcement, right? The idea of then how do we get it out onto the street in terms of enforcing that law, regulating it, and then putting in place uh, what punitive measures we have to fine them, uh, to close their businesses, uh, to uh, slap fines on their businesses or on people, to arrest them. Uh, what do we do in those particular situations? So that leads uh, to a whole other aspect of this idea of implementation in terms of how do we make sure that the honest people are staying honest. Uh, and that really is the, the proposed, uh, that really is the approach moving from here, uh, from that, that uh, rulemaking and, and regulatory process. So the legislation related to this bureaucracy, some really great examples here of, of some constraints uh, that are placed on uh, the bureaucracy by government, by the, uh, the Congress and the president. The Administrative Procedures Act is essentially, um, uh, they have policies and procedures for how they can actually create these regulations. Um, so uh, they have a, a playbook if you will, the APA, uh, which addresses how do we write these regulations? How do we propose them? Uh, what process do we follow? That chart we just looked at. Uh, a lot of that is outlined in the Administrative Procedure Act. Uh, freedom of information. If there is something that the agency is doing, uh, sunshine laws provide uh, that people have to be able to ask for public information to be made available uh, on a website or um, through hard copies and um, and they have to be, uh, over a period of time, they have to be made available. If they are public information, then they're not deemed classified. Uh, and so that information needs to be shared with the public. And anybody can ask for it. They issue what's called a FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act, FOIA, a FOIA request. Uh, and, and a lot of uh, journalists will do this. Members of the media will do this because they want to uh, find out what's going on in government. What are they working on? What are they doing? And so a lot of these proposed rules, uh, rulemaking, comment periods, all that kind of stuff is all public information, many of them on their websites, uh, the, the websites we looked at in the in the uh, part one video, and um, and uh, the uh, the rules and proposed rules and the comments uh, for public comment, all of those are available through Freedom of Information Act. Um, so that really governs um, keeping uh, the government honest in terms of uh, sharing with the public what information can be shared um, and making sure that um, that uh, what they're doing is out in the in the uh, public, uh, in the open air, in terms of uh, what they're trying to do, so that Congress can step in and say, "Whoa, what do you think you're doing here? Uh, that's not a really great idea." Uh, and without that FOIA. Uh, Congress wouldn't have that mechanism. Interest groups do the same thing. They're trying to find out. The media do the same thing. They're trying to find out, all in a way that's going to constrain the bureaucracy in terms of uh, limiting what, what power they have to actually uh, regulate and enforce the law. Now, the National Environmental Policy Act, again, uh, these are uh, about environmental standards that have to be submitted here, so that's more on the environment aspect, but it does impact more than just the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, it impacts other agencies, uh, National Transportation uh, Safety Safety Board, for instance, um, the, um, uh, the Department of Transportation for another, uh, because uh, if you're going to build a highway, a lot of times there's environmental impact to that. If you're building a new headquarters, FBI was working on this for a while, uh, that is going to, to uh, impact the environment if you're building something. Um, all of those uh, have NEPA, the, uh, the NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, uh, to guide them in terms of trying to get the bureaucracy uh, to follow those guidelines. The Privacy Act. Now, there are aspects in which uh, personnel records um, of individuals who work for the government uh, can't be released. Uh, so again, it's hard to fire someone within the bureaucracy. It's also hard to find out uh, whether uh, they really uh, aren't doing a very good job because of the, of the Privacy Act uh, for those 
excuse me, for those personal records that we see there. So uh, that becomes very difficult for an administrator because a lot of those are, are classified documents and they're unauthorized uh, for many individuals uh, to be able to look in terms of hiring uh, individuals into a new agency or a commission if somebody's trying to make a, make a move. Um, that's very difficult uh, for the bureaucracy to, um, to hire the best of the best uh, when a lot of those records aren't available, uh, aren't made available in order to make those decisions. And then the open meeting law, also called the Sunshine Law, uh, you can't hold meetings in private. Um, and uh, you have to be able to give people access to those meetings. Now, with uh, the, the, the joy of Zoom and, um, and uh, Skype and uh, WebEx and other resources, it's much easier to have those open meetings and, and allow people to participate. Um, but uh, people have to have access to the meetings and to the records associated with those meetings. Uh, if, they are, if they are available publicly, uh, the people should be able to access them. And again, through FOIA, through the Freedom of Information Act, should be able to have access to them. The, all of those things are constraining the bureaucracy. All of those are trying to address uh, the issues related uh, to how the bureaucracy carries out the law. How does it implement it? How does it regulate it? Uh, and then, and how does it move forward? And uh, these are aspects to guide the bureaucracy, Congress passing them in order to try and help them address um, what is it that we want Congress, uh, what is it that Congress wants the bureaucracy to do? Well, these kind of provide them with a bit of a framework. But again, it's also pretty general uh, in that it's all agencies that are given this Administrative Procedure Act. You have to tailor it, of course, uh, to deal with uh, broadcast and cable um, outlets when it comes to the Federal Communications Commission, or when it comes to uh, the Federal Aviation Administration, how does it uh, how does it apply to airlines? How does it apply uh, to car manufacturers? How does it apply to farmers? Uh, and all those different aspects have to be tailored, and it's the bureaucracy that's going to do that tailoring. So some some constraints uh, that are trying to address here, um, uh, it's going to mean that uh, the government, in terms of having to comply with those laws, it's going to slow it down. It's also going to uh, have to tailor it, uh, which means that sometimes they may be inconsistent in terms of how they approach it. How uh, the, ag the Agriculture Department addresses uh, the Administrative Procedures Act may be very different than how the Federal Aviation Administration will address the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, and so there's some inconsistency there. It's also um, easy, uh, I should say easier, uh, for... Um, uh, agencies to be blocked in terms of action they can take rather than being able to take action. Uh, they can't be very proactive. Uh, they are very reactive. And a lot of what they're trying to do, uh, it plays out in the courts, uh, plays out in the courts in terms of, uh, of, of action that they are taking and uh, being sued by uh, individuals or states or other um, entities uh, trying to keep them from implementing laws. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes those are successful and sometimes not, but it definitely slows that process down. And then um, uh, one aspect of, of, of discretionary authority is uh, many times you have people that are on the lower rungs of the, uh, of, of the uh, civil service that are really um, uh, gun shy about making decisions. Uh, and that leads uh, to a lot of reluctance and it leads to a lot of overlap and duplication because then they have to approach their superiors who have to stop what they're doing in order to answer those questions. All of that stuff takes time. Uh, and that time is not on your side if you only have four years to get this implemented. Uh, you can see how it slows the process down. Uh, where do these constraints come from? They come from us. They come from us. Uh, we love gridlock. Uh, look at how we voted in this election. Uh, we voted for gridlock. Uh, they, they voted for uh, a Biden-Harris ticket before a Republican uh, Senate for the most part and for a very slim Democratic majority in the House. Um, if, they're not, if that's not a, a message uh, for government to work together, compromise, and find ways uh, to get things done, um, and if you don't, well, then, then we don't have to worry about it because you're not going to be doing anything. You're not going to be getting anything done. Um, that is the name of the game right now. Uh, that seems to be the consensus of the American electorate in terms of um, the numbers that came out to vote, but in terms of also what those numbers said. Uh, and that we see those constraints uh, on the bureaucracy are reflected in the electorate in terms of, uh, in terms of what, what's, um, what's being addressed there. So uh, we uh, continue to support those constraints uh, as the American electorate uh, in, in terms of what we want to see from these agencies. We want to see more openness. We want to see uh, fairness. We want to see uh, things that are um, what the citizens want. Uh, but we also uh, want to see 
uh, it done in a way that is um, consistent, uh, that is above board, that isn't corrupt, uh, that isn't a reflection of the pathologies we're going to talk about, the idea of waste, fraud, and abuse, uh, and really addresses the issues that government should be addressing and no more, um, and then get government out of the way so that business and industry and, and consumers can do their thing. And that really is the, the approach uh, that we vote for uh, when, we walk into the, when we walk into the voting booth. All right, so let's shift gears and talk about pathologies. Uh, these are the problems of the bureaucracy, the bureaucratic pathologies, the problems that the bureaucracy has in terms of uh, why things don't get done. Uh, there's really five main reasons for this. Uh, the first one is red tape. Uh, this is the idea of all kinds of paperwork, all kinds of policies, procedures, rules. You saw the list of constraints around the Administrative Procedure Act and uh, other aspects uh, that have to be carried out before they can even think, even think of proposing uh, rulemaking uh, that, that is open for public comment. And all of that has to be shared with the public. Okay, and, and those meetings that take place around that have to be open meetings, uh, have to be shared with the public, and the public is invited to attend. All of these things slow down the process uh, and really keep uh, government from being able to move quickly on these items. Um, so that's red tape. Conflict. Uh, we have agencies uh, that are basically uh, one agency says one thing, one says another, and, and we're like, seriously, we've got two agencies that are doing... Uh, basically very different things. Um, Hurricane Katrina was a really good example of this. Uh, we had an agency that was sending trucks full of ice uh, to uh, places like St. Louis, and then they weren't getting any other feedback about what to do once they got there. Uh, they ran out of gas, they ran out of fuel, uh, all of the ice melted. And um, meanwhile, another agency is saying, send out those trucks. Uh, send out those trucks. We need those trucks down uh, down here in um, in Louisiana. And um, and the messages weren't getting through. Uh, the the conflict was there. And as a result, um, it was a, a great example of conflict, but a great example of waste um, in terms of the resources that were wasted uh, that could have helped a lot of people that really needed it at that time. That's a great example of a, the pathology of conflict. Uh, well, let's look at duplication. So you, here you have an agency uh, that is doing something and you have another agency that's doing almost the exact same thing. Um, uh, and a good example of this is a form to fill out. We have uh, forms uh, that we fill out in, in MCPS when we want to uh, go on a field trip. And um, and uh, the, the field trip forms, many cases, they're very duplicative, uh, but it's a different department within central office uh, that gets that particular um, form. And so uh, that's why we have to fill them out. Uh, that's a, an example of a pathology of duplication. Um, and agencies, unfortunately, do this a lot. And consumers, of course, waste more time filling out the exact, almost the exact same form uh, for a particular agency uh, because that, that agency needs it for whatever purpose uh, in order to fulfill their regulations. That's a great example of duplication. It really does slow down the process and uh, makes it less effective in terms of people uh, being able to get things done. Uh, then we have imperialism, uh, the idea of an agency that's growing. We need more people. We need more support. Uh, we've seen a lot of this with Health and Human Services during the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we saw this um, after the Great Depression, uh, in the uh, Department of Agriculture. Uh, we saw this with the Defense Department during the military industrial complex of the uh, 50s, uh, where they're really ramping up because of the Cold War, ramping up a lot of um, uh, imperialism in terms of the, uh, the growth of that agency, adding more military readiness uh, in terms of uh, what we need, regardless of what uh, cost or size uh, would, would be for that particular uh, department. Uh, but this is an example of imperialism. Our department is more important than any other department. Give us the resources. We need more people. We need more resources. We need more funding. We need more staff. Uh, all of this is very imperialistic um, because it doesn't necessarily uh, lead to a bureaucracy that is more uh, responsive to the needs of the people uh, and, and more cost effective. It leads to a lot of the waste, fraud, abuse, and corruption uh, that, we, that, we, that we know about uh, and that we perceive uh, to be from that Gallup poll we, we looked at early on in terms of what uh, the government isn't doing right and how they can do better. And the last one is waste. We've all heard about the, uh, the $400 hammer or the, the uh, $600 toilet seat or, or the uh, $800,000 outhouse in the middle of nowhere by the National Park Service. Uh, all of these we look at and go, why on earth would we spend these types of things? Uh, this is an example of waste. How can we better use the American people's money, uh, their tax dollars, in a way that's more effective? Um, and so uh, 
this is the uh, this is the idea of waste pathology. And these are the five examples that when we talk about waste, fraud, and abuse um, and corruption of the bureaucracy, uh, these are the five that that really uh, are the most common in the bureaucracy that really get that really underscore that that perception uh, that the bureaucracy is the the big government is uh, the biggest threat to our democracy uh, because of what we see in these uh, in these five pathologies. So unfortunately, uh, that is the uh, the cause. The effect is we see it in the perception. We see it in the, the polling uh, that people really think this is a, a, a major problem. Now forget the fact that uh, most of, of, of government bureaucracy that's carried out today uh, really is fully functioning and it does it without news headlines, um, but we don't hear those things. We, we hear about what's wrong with government and what goes wrong and and how it's the fleecing of america how it's waste fraud and abuse that needs to be uh that needs to be reined in and so that's the message that gets perpetuated and that's uh, what gets picked up and what gets heard by the american people uh, as you can imagine, it is a very costly process to implement these rules. Uh, you can see here in terms of how much money it costs to enforce uh, these rules. Notice the federal government now employs 279,000 full-time workers engaged in regulatory activities. Uh, this idea uh, is, you know, and, and the TSA, the Transportation Security Agency, um, you know, 18% of them uh, are, are in that particular agency because it's such a huge uh, environment. But notice $63 billion um, is government spending uh, on federal regulated um, act activities uh, in terms of uh, what we see here. And that was in FY16, in fiscal year 2016. Uh, you can see the uh, the concerns about the abuse, which leads to a lot of the political cartoons that I'm not going to spend a ton of time on, uh, but some really funny ones in terms of, well, I'm the assistant to the aide of the deputy vice chairman of the committee to reduce Pentagon bureaucracy, right? Ha 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 ha, lol, lol, lol. Um, but uh, you can see where they get the bad name, right? Because you have so much imperialism, uh, the pathology of imperialism that really addresses this, and uh, you can see the problem that is created as a result. Well, I started a task force to eliminate redundancies in our internal processes. Really? I'm doing the same thing. Oh my goodness, we have we have duplication uh, that's actually uh, taking place here. And then uh, who can forget the red tape, right? Uh, so government bureaucracy, um, again, we have lots of pathologies in place. And again, they do underscore and reinforce the problems uh, and the perceptions that we see in government. Uh, but it is not without um, uh, mentioning that uh, we also see a lot of uh, well, in a lot of cases, we don't see a lot of things that go right in government and how things get done uh, that we mainly never hear about uh, because they are successful and they keep us safe. And and those things uh, we, we tend to gloss over and, and we don't hear about them because um, media outlets don't necessarily run them. Uh, so that uh, is a, an interesting uh, an interesting take on, on what doesn't get reported. And we'll talk about that more when we get to the media chapter. Okay, so what power does the president have over the bureaucracy then in terms of accountability? Well, uh, in this aspect, remember the president appoints. Uh, the president can also... Um, uh, propose a reorganization. The president, uh, President Bush, did that in terms of the Department of Homeland Security. But again, Congress has to approve that. Um, the president can propose changes in the annual budget, but again, it's Congress that actually has the final say in the power of the purse there uh, in terms of addressing it. And then um, the um, the uh, priorities uh, uh, the, of the policy agenda can be carried out here as well. So uh, how do we? Um, uh, prioritize what the uh, bureaucracy does and carries out. That is the power that the president has and the president's alone, as well as uh, what policies he wants them to focus on. Uh, he can issue executive orders to get them to do it. He can um, issue policy priorities or, or issue uh, tweets in order to, to make that happen. And he can also propose and, and, and cut their budgets. Uh, and budget, uh, the uh, Budget and Control uh, Impoundment Act uh, basically says, uh, you know, the, the president spends the money, he can give it, give it back to Congress. But if the president doesn't like what the agency is doing, the president can reduce their budget and send the money back to Congress. Uh, the president doesn't have to use uh, that particular money in doing so. And um, that is a power that the president has over the bureaucracy in terms of um, 
in, in terms of the limitations it places on the bureaucracy. Now, Congress, again, power of the purse, uh, most important here, and, and, the, and the last one on the list, uh, but Congress can actually um, pass legis legislation that, that reiterates or refines what they want the bureaucracy to do. Uh, they can get rid of programs. They can uh, call for hearings and conduct oversight in terms of what an agency is doing in order to get them to focus more on what they should be doing. And, uh, and uh, they can also limit an agency's uh, ability to write rules and, and draft rules around it. Um, that is power that Congress holds, and uh, Congress does have that power. Um, uh, that's not usually something that uh, the president would would veto necessarily. Usually they're going to try and work out those details behind the scenes to keep Congress happy and the president uh, in terms of whatever legislation they're passing. Uh, but that is power that Congress does have over the bureaucracy. Um, one aspect of, of this uh, Chevron case um, which is kind of interesting, and we won't go into a lot of detail here, but uh, President Reagan in 1981 uh, decided to get the uh, EPA to change uh, how they looked at the Clean Air Act. Um, and this is a case that we, we hear a lot about, the Chevron case. It actually came up in uh, um, Associate Justice uh, Gorsuch's uh, confirmation hearings. He talked about this Chevron case um, because uh, this idea of, of deference uh, in terms of allowing an agency to interpret what the law means uh, is really giving the court a lot of power. Um, but um, the, uh, the ruling in this case by the courts was to give the agencies that power of interpretation um, because they wanted the agencies to be able to have the, the flexibility um, based on what Congress passes in terms of a law, um, and especially if they're vague in doing so. Uh, to be able to read between the lines and uh, try and interpret the legislative intent uh, without the courts uh, so that um, they can um, basically write regulations around it. Now, um, the idea here is uh, can, con can the court still step in and, and declare something unconstitutional? Well, of course, of course they can. Uh, but that is an aspect in which um, they said we will defer to the agencies of the bureaucracy in terms of their interpretation because it makes sense that what they're trying to do is enforce the law. And if it's a vague law that was written, how do we enforce that? Well, we've got to have some uh, flexibility in terms of how we are writing these rules and regulations to carry this out. And um, and uh, the idea is uh, we've got to give them some some flexibility in doing so. Uh, so they are they they have given the the courts. Uh, excuse me, they have given the bureaucracy, the courts have given the bureaucracy uh, the power to be able to do that and carry that out. So that's what we see kind of playing out here in this Chevron case. And it is an important one. Uh, and, and Neil Gorsuch was asked about it uh, because he, you know, basically was being asked, well, if you're on the court, are you going to agree with Chevron, this Chevron case uh, that the agencies have the power to basically do some interpretation of the rulemaking uh, as they create those regulations. Uh, and uh, and he really tried to steer away from it in terms of uh, not necessarily addressing how he viewed that particular issue. Uh, and that was during the Reagan administration that that was, uh, that, that broke down. Now, another example of, of again, carrying out the law is the 9-11 Commission. Uh, this was um, uh, conducted by Congress. And, um, but the idea here uh, was how do you interpret this report and how do you then carry it out in terms of rules and regulations? You need some discretionary authority to do so. And it's the bureaucracy that's going to be tasked with carrying that out. Um, so this is a great example of, of that, that, um, uh, that, that in, uh, legislative intent and uh, the rulemaking authority uh, that that the bureaucracy has in terms of how do we craft this into regulation that we can actually use, we can actually put into, into action in terms of the law. Okay. And then uh, looking here, the Department of Labor, again, another example of equal employment opportunity. Uh, how, do, how does the uh, agency interpret this? How do they apply it? All of these are factors of, of this, um, this idea of bureaucratic uh, discretionary authority in terms of carrying out the law. And, uh, and how does that play out? Okay, so let's shift gears now and look at the policy aspects. Just a couple of things as we wrap up this chapter uh, in looking at uh, the policy and how the uh, bureaucracy is, is impacting the branches of government in this, uh, in this relationship. Now, um, in looking at how the, the bureaucracy works, we've talked about this uh, in terms of carrying out the law, uh, issuing the regulations, uh, really trying to make this happen. 
And we know that uh, many uh, Americans are skeptical of this, right? Um, they uh, see big government as the problem, not as the solution. Uh, President Reagan said that essentially, you know, the, 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 the most dangerous words in the English language are I'm here, I'm, I'm from the government, I'm here to help or something like that. Uh, we see a lot of things that happened along the way uh, that were disasters, things like the space shuttles blowing up, 9-11, uh, uh, Hurricane Katrina, uh, the, uh, the intelligence used to invade Iraq, uh, the weapons of mass destruction. Uh, all of these are, are failures of the bureaucracy. Um, and, uh, and yet, um, they, they do contribute to that idea that, you know, big government is part of the problem. Um, but, um, we've also found that it's a lot harder to manage that bureaucracy in terms of, um, in terms of, uh, all of the individual, uh, agencies and departments and commissions and, and, uh, corporations that are involved here. But we've also done some pretty successful things. Uh, we've, we've done a lot of successful things like, uh, you know, using, uh, NASA to, to land a man on the moon. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the approach and the success in, um, in looking at uh, uh, fighting in, in world wars, uh, in in uh, approaching uh, diseases uh, like the uh, the nineteen eight what the nineteen twenty flu pandemic, uh, looking at coronavirus with NIH, uh, the AIDS epidemic, uh, all of these uh, we can see where uh, the federal bureaucracy has actually helped in a lot of these situations. Uh, may not necessarily have started there, but definitely ended there in terms of uh, trying to help address problems and uh, and help the American people and. Uh, that really is the intent of the federal bureaucracy. Um, but uh, the aspect here is how does uh, the federal bureaucracy using policy affect the branches? Um, and it's important to note um, that uh, Congress uh, doesn't have this power anymore. It's unconstitutional uh, under the INS v. Chata case, uh, which isn't one you need to know, but it is important that Congress tried to use what we call a legislative veto, uh, essentially uh, giving the president the authority to um, essentially uh, veto an action that an agency takes. And um, and uh, the Supreme Court said that's unconstitutional. That takes away the legislative power uh, that Congress should have. Uh, the line item veto, very similar uh, to that. And um, and basically said no, you you can't do that, which limited the president's power in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, the rulemaking or the authority of setting the policy agenda over an agency. Um, but it doesn't negate the fact that the president can issue an executive order uh, that can basically uh, uh, try and get the agency to whip into shape in terms of what uh, the president wants them to do. Um, in terms of other branches, uh, again, Congress. Uh, establishes these, these agencies, gives them the, the funding and the money, conducts hearings and calls them in for questions, uh, can even get rid of their agencies um, in terms of in terms of that. Um, and the uh, the president, uh, as I mentioned, the executive orders, the EOs, as well as reorganizing, uh, proposing to reorganize agencies or, or nominating agency heads uh, can fire them as well. And again, setting the priorities. And then the Supreme Court can step in uh, on agency actions and rule them unconstitutional. Uh, so there is definite accountability here in terms of what the uh, federal bureaucracy can and cannot do in terms of how um, the uh, branches can check of the different aspects of the bureaucracy and really try and keep them in line. And that really uh, tries to get them to streamline their policy implementation, to focus on what the legislative intent was, what the policy agenda of the president is, and to make sure uh, that it is constitutionally acceptable uh, by the courts in order to do so. Uh, so we, we see definite accountability that is trying to keep the bureaucracy in shape and trying to keep them focused on what it is that they need to do. Now, uh, the trust in bureaucracy, uh, as we can see, um, that has changed over time. And, uh, well, there's not a lot of trust in government in general, right? Uh, but we definitely don't see it in terms of trust in government. And, uh, and this uh, data definitely from, this is another Gallup poll uh, from another textbook, but I like it because it really does show um, that um, that has that has changed over time. And as a result of that, it um, has definitely shown us that uh, that uh, the going back to the other Gallup poll, uh, big government is the problem. How do we change that? Well, we change it with better, more responsive, more impactful uh, bureaucratic programs that really touch people's lives. And that stuff isn't news. Uh, that stuff isn't uh, addressed in uh, what people are seeing in the news. They're only seeing the bad things that happen. And so um, 
you're kind of in a conundrum here because how does the bureaucracy really uh, kind of move forward and carry out the success of, of what's going on? Uh, it's hard to do that because they're not getting the same coverage as other places did. Uh, and then I love this one, you know, all of the different uh, titles on the door in terms of a chairman of the uh, of the task force to reduce government bureaucracy and whatnot. And we could go on all day in terms of the um, the uh, different aspects of, of the, the cartoons that are here. But I think you get the idea. Um, uh, in terms of in, in terms of this. So uh, here's a chance for you to review some questions based on the bureaucracy. Hope you found this helpful. Uh, this concludes part two uh, of the uh, of the federal bureaucracy, uh, the overview of the chapter. Hope you found it helpful and uh, stick around. We will be back for the highlights next week in looking at the uh, the top 12 highlights of the federal bureaucracy. So stay tuned. Good luck on that upcoming uh, quiz test AP exam.